thank you all for being here uh, at this uh, uh, panel discussion, which kicks off the meeting, Humanities Approaches to the Opioid Crisis, the public face of the crisis. Um, each fall, the Center for the Humanities holds a forum focused on sharing the knowledge and skills applicable to solving deep-seated social problems that they develop in their disciplines. The Center's assumption is that the humanities, the academic disciplines that study aspects of human society and culture, what it means to be human, can offer a language that is a bridge building across institutional and disciplinary borders, providing innovative thinking and perspectives that are complementary to those of other professions. This year's forum takes on the opioid crisis. This evening and all day tomorrow, humanity scholars, medical professionals, artists whose work centers on addiction, and government officials are gathering for a series of panels that bridge disciplines, seeking to identify common understanding and solutions. Country singer Keith Whitley, who struggled and died as a result of addiction, had a great hit. It was, I'm No Stranger to the Rain, which was an allegorical title. Here in New England, in our urban centers and seemingly idyllic towns, we are not strangers to the rain, R-E-I-G-N, of addiction in many forms, including opioid addiction. The problems associated with it are complex. Many experts from different disciplines are working on the health, social, and economic causes for the stranglehold that opioids and other forms of addiction have on people's lives. Our colleagues at Boston University have recognized that the humanities have knowledge and insight that can be applied to help turn the tide against addiction, hence this forum. This broad, the broad range of disciplines represented on this evening's panel indicates to you, I believe, our expectation that the turning the tide against the opioid crisis will require all of these perspectives. Our distinguished speakers include Sandro Galea, the Robert A. Knox Professor and Dean of BU's School of Public Health. He has collaborated closely with BU Center for the Humanities uh, and his director, Susan Mesrucci, to plan this forum. Dean Galea has made s many seminal contributions to the literature in epidemiology and publishes regularly in many public media outlets on, the spec on a spectrum of human health issues that confront us today. His latest book, Healthier, 50 Thoughts on the Foundations of Population Health, published by Oxford Press, was heralded as the book everyone interested in health must read. Coming to us from New York City is Samuel Clayton Roberts, Associate Professor of the History and of Social Medical Sciences, who holds dual affiliations at Columbia University School of Arts and Sciences and the Mailman School of Public Health. Professor Roberts, who writes and lectures widely about black politics and history with a particular focus on public health, is currently completing a book titled To Enter a Society Which Doesn't Want Them, uh, Race, Recovery, and America's Misadventures in Drug Policy, tracing addiction politics from the post-war era and early methadone maintenance through the war on drugs and into the period of harm reduction and syringe exchanges. Elaine Scarry is Professor M, is the Walter M. Uh, Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and General Theory of Value and Harvard College Professor at Harvard University. Professor Scarry's The Body and Pain is a seminal work in the field. A widely published writer, her abiding interests include beauty and its relation to justice, mental, verbal, and material creation, citizenship and consent, and the language of pain, and the 19th century British novel and 20th century drama. Professor Scarry published Thermal Nuclear Monarchy in 2014, and in 2000, fall of 2017, co-chaired a conference, Presidential First Use of Nuclear Weapons. Is it legal? Is it constitutional? Is it just? Nora Volkow, our final panelist, is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA. Uh, which supports a significant amount of global research on the health, aspect, health aspects of drug abuse and addiction. Dr. Volkow's 
work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. As a physical, as a research psychiatrist and scientist, Dr. Volkow pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate the, investigate the topic, toxic effects and addictive properties of abusable drugs. Her studies have documented changes in the dopamine system uh, affecting, among others, the function of the frontal uh, brain regions involved, involved with motivation, drive, and pleasure in addiction. And finally, we are pleased that Martha Biebinger, award-winning reporter at WBUR who covers healthcare and much else besides, and is a graduate of Boston University, will be this evening's moderator. Following the panel discussion, uh, Ms. Biebinger will field questions from the audience, and after that, the evening will conclude with a reception in the lounge adjoining this room, at which time I hope the conversations will continue. Please join me in welcoming these eminent thinkers, teachers, and doers, to paraphrase the School of Public Health motto. Good evening, everyone. So we're very excited to be here tonight for the first chance to draw and analyze the public face of the opioid epidemic. But with five Massachusetts residents on average dying daily, I know that this is personal for many of you. Now, as Sandro and Susan Mizrucki, who pulled together this fabulous event, said in a piece recently, we'll make strides much more quickly if we recognize that the epidemic is about us and not some them out there. So I wondered if I could start with a show of hands, anyone who has been touched by the opioid epidemic. That's really amazing. Um, anyone wanna share a few names? Just call out the name of someone in your lives who's been touched by the epidemic. Maybe that's a little too personal to start, but I'll tell you about my nephew, Austin, who went into rehab three weeks ago. My sister picked him up on the streets of Houston. Uh, he had become homeless after becoming addicted to the pills. Um, I've got a brother-in-law in recovery and a cousin in recovery. So it hits really close to home for me as well. So let's keep it about those faces, those people who we thought of just a few minutes ago when we were first introducing the panel as we talk in more depth about some of the causes, prevention strategies, bits of history that we need to understand, and strategies going forward. So I'm gonna ask each of the panelists, Dr. Brown very kindly introduced the panelists, I'm gonna ask each of them to start with a little bit of their perspective on the epidemic currently, and a few questions or issues they wanna be sure that we get at tonight. Sandra? This one is on. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Susan, for um, for uh, organizing this, and uh, President Brown and Martha for uh, introducing us. So, um, by um, by way of disciplinary uh, orientation, I'm an epidemiologist, and um, a lot of my work has been at the intersection of uh, of behavioral epidemiology and social epidemiology. So, I, I've I've actually been doing studies around this area for almost 20 years now, and um, my team did some some of the earliest work that showed the feasibility of naloxone distribution um, uh, by lay uh, people at a time when it was actually illegal to do so in uh, New York City in the early aughts. So I've sort of been engaged in this issue for quite some time, and um, it's really quite remarkable to have this kind of attention paid to it. But in a couple of minutes, which um, really is all I want to talk about, I just thought I would make um, six points um, very quickly, and really just to label them for our discussion from an epidemiologic point of view. So the first point. The first point is, we're here because we know there's an epidemic. We know 65,000 people a year die from the opioid epidemic. But I do want to make the point that we've actually had a lot of people die from opioids for a long time. Um, um, 2010, about 40,000 people were dying from opioids. And that's more people than died at the peak of the HIV epidemic, a motor vehicle, death epidemic, or firearm epidemic. And that was 2010. That was like eight years ago. And I would challenge us all to think about how much attention we're paying to the issue back in 2010. And the answer is, you know, not that much. I mean, a lot of people in the field were paying attention to it, but in the broader conversation, it was just never there. So number one, 
this is a real issue epidemiologically, and uh, but one that's been an issue for a long time, um, uh, and we really haven't been paying as much attention to it. One of the big puzzles for me, and I think there's a good book to be written about this, as to why we haven't paid as much attention to it broadly um, uh, earlier than that. That's number one. The second point is um, this is really an epidemic, and um, I often show, if I were to show slides, I would show you a picture of the spread of opioids across the country. and. Uh, what I often do in my talks is I show that picture without telling people what that spread is, and people typically think it's an infectious disease, and uh, when you think it's infectious disease, you jump into action. You say, wow, we should do something about that bug. Uh, and again, it's been spreading for the past 20 years in a very clear infectious pattern, and it's important to remember that as this epidemic has spread, it really hasn't been just one epidemic. It's been a shifting epidemic from non-medical prescription opioids to heroin and now to synthetics. So there's a very clear epidemic spread, and uh, that epidemic spread really should have given us cause for alarm quite a while ago. That's the second point. The third point, our engagement with this issue, the burden of this issue is disproportionate, vastly disproportionate to other countries. It is true that opioids remain a problem, um, are a problem and an increasing problem in many other countries, but we have been well ahead of other countries on this. And it's important to remember that, that this is a, there's a particular, particular American issue at the moment over and above everybody else. Fourth, fourth is, the, the, um, this issue comes on top of a lot of more fundamental challenges. That, um, and one of them is our overall challenge with dealing with substance use in general. So only about 10% of people who could benefit from specialist drug use treatment actually get it. Now, there are many reasons for that, but one of the core reasons is only about 10% of people who would benefit from specialized substance use treatment think they would benefit. Which, if you think about it, it's quite remarkable. Like, what if I told you that only 10% of people who actually had a broken arm actually thought they would benefit from seeing someone for their broken arm? Right? It's actually quite astonishing. So we have a national uh, blind spot about drugs. We, 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 we have historically, and we're going to hear this from my colleagues who are more in the humanities, uh, consider drugs so much a criminal issue that we have historically really struggled with thinking about drugs and effective treatment for drugs. That's the fourth point. Um, the fifth point is cost. I don't want to forget cost. This is an enormously costly problem. It's very unclear how much the cost is, but probably the best estimates come from the Office of Management and Budget, and their general uh, estimate is about 2.83% of, of GDP is the cost associated with the opioid epidemic, and which, if you think about it, is really amazing. It's really an amazingly high cost for any epidemic. So this is enormous high cost, five. And the last point I want to make is that epidemics like this do not happen without a backdrop, without a backdrop of a culture, that, and there's many different reasons for this, which we can discuss, that was ripe for an epidemic like this to rage across the country, to grow the way this has over the past 20 years. There is enormously high correlation between um, what has been called sort of diseases of despair, we can argue whether that's right or not, across the country. Enormously high correlation with uh, issues of low, un of low employment, issues of poverty, um, and when you look at the patterns where it started from rural areas moving to urban areas, um, the opioid epidemic was fueled, in many respects, metaphorically. It was, it was dry tinder, and it was really only a matter of time before um, the wildfire took. So, summary, this is something that's it's a real epidemic, has been evolving over time, has been coming over the past 20 years. We really are paying attention to it quite a bit late. Um, costs us a lot of money, but builds on, on some core fundamental issues that we have as a country, which is our challenge dealing with drug use and a lot of other social issues that go untended. Thank you. Wow, great, Sandra. Samuel. <laughs> All right, good afternoon or good evening. I, I would also like to echo thanks to the organizers, to Susan, to Sandro, to President Brown and, and, and all of you here for, for being here. I really look forward to this meeting. <clears throat> These don't happen very often. We quite often look at this crisis mainly from a policy point of view and quite often from a evidence-based point of view, it, as well we should. Um, I participate in a lot of those conferences, but I think quite often that in, in doing so, we often forget the, the, the narrative behind that. And when I think of medical humanities, I often think of narrative as, as having such an important part in that. Uh, I was asked to speak, well, we all were, we were asked to speak about something that, that we, th we were supposed to offer something that Perhaps you all should know about the opioid epidemic. I think I'm paraphrasing some of our instructions there. And there's something for me which I've always found fascinating, 
since this arose to um, our popular uh, uh, consciousness some years ago, as, as Sandro said, 2010, uh, 2011 is when the CDC announced it as a crisis, but we really didn't start paying attention to this to really about maybe three, two or three years ago, really. 15, really. Yeah, until about, yeah, 15. It was about 16 when the, the death started to spike. That brings us to the spring of 17, which if, if I'm going to take you back a ways, and I know in the chronography of, a, of American history, seven, uh, about 18, 20 months ago is a really long time ago. Um, I envy dogs who age seven times longer than we do, because I feel like I'm <laughs> aging about 14 years per year at this point. Um, but if you remember that early 2017, there were, there were two questions that were in the punditry's collective mind. Um, <clears throat> one was, how did this guy win, <clears throat> right? President Trump, that's, we gotta get used to calling him that, you know? Like, how did that happen? That was all over the news. And then the second question was, how do we get all these white quote unquote addicts? <clears throat> You all remember, if you, if you look back, or if you think back, you remember that quite a bit of our national, which is our domestic-oriented uh, writing was geared towards those two questions. It seems like you couldn't escape it in any outlet. And interestingly, <clears throat> the, the answer to both of them was, was white pain, right? I mean, in answer to how did he get not the majority of the popular vote, but certainly enough to get a, you know, what really constituted a landslide in the electoral, People pointed to the economically disfranchised, disenfranchised, alienated, um, you know, the, he called them the, the silent majority, which is something he cribbed off of Nixon some 40 years before, um, to explain that electoral win. At the same time, that was the same answer that was given for the rise of opioid use amongst our white population. It was really, uh, no one really caught that. It was I was waiting for someone to like some, pithy writer for, you know, like the nation or the new republic to do something with like opiate of the masses, like, you know, a Karl Marx false consciousness, like, you know, no one did it. And if, if anyone does do that, you need to cite me, please. <laughs> or maybe I just need to publish it and get ahead of you. Um, also, it's really interesting because in a lot of ways, <clears throat> that was the narrative, right? As we know, like, it's, the narrative isn't about the answer, it's about the question being asked, right? You could have answered that question just as easily Instead of white pain, you could have said, well, let's take a look at black America, right? If you think about it, you know, it's so odd. Like, how do we have all these white, you know, addicts in this despair? And addicts, by the way, it's not a term I use. This is what was used in the punditry. I don't use the word. It's stigmatizing and inaccurate, if you ask me. Um, if we had looked at what had happened in black America during the heroin years of the 1960s and 70s and crack cocaine in the 1980s, those were economically depressed areas just like Appalachia is today. Selling crack cocaine actually really got you about minimum wage. Nobody was really getting filthy rich, you know, as we were led to believe by Ronald Reagan and others, but there were no minimum wage jobs to be had. So these were, we were looking at diseases of despair 30 years ago. Of course, we didn't treat them as such. <clears throat> we had mandatory minimum sentences, et cetera, et cetera. The other way that black Americans might have answered that question is that We've had four elections in American history that were won, uh, presidential elections that were won without winning the majority of the popular vote. Two of those, by the way, in the last 20 years. On the last two, we had, on the first one in 2000, which all you know, hung on Florida for the most part, there were some two million people who were disenfranchised <clears throat> because of felony, previous felony convictions and had served their time. I'm not talking about people who were inside serving their times, people who are walking free amongst us, um, otherwise free except not having the franchise. 2016, the sentencing uh, project in Washington, D.C. estimates the number to be six million, about 40% of whom, you know, a large proportion of whom were in for drug felony convictions, and probably anywhere between 40 and 60% are black and Latinx, all right? I'm not making a, 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 a strategy note about how you win the next election. I do believe that we need to re-enfranchise our, our people who have returned home. Like the same way I do not believe that voter suppression is a, fundamentally a democratic principle. <clears throat> I'm not making a partisan call on that. It would, it would certainly be in bad form, given that we have Nora with us as well, who's a member of the federal government. Um, even though I am tempted to ask you about that, uh, that anonymous op-ed last month. If, you, wanted, <laughs> if you, you know who wrote it, don't you, Nora? I, that's all right, I'll, we'll find out. Well, you, you can't, yeah, you can't say. Um, 
All to say is that, getting back to the narrative is really the point of it, is that we really need to think about how we understand and how we're talking about this thing that we call, you know, many of us call addiction, substance use disorder. I just prefer to sometimes just say people having problems with life, right? That kind of actually humanizes it. They're not any different from someone who doesn't use drugs but also has problems in their life in a lot of ways. Um, we need to think about that, but we also need to think about what it means to be in recovery. I think we're now, and I'm glad we're all starting to think about harm reduction and embrace it as a policy future, but I don't think enough of us actually are giving consideration to an idea of recovery that means something more than just not using drugs. Right? There's a lot of people out there, as there were in the 1960s, in the 70s and 1980s, who fundamentally need a lot of help. And it's, it's beyond just their relationship with a drug. Like if we're gonna talk about you know, how we answer those two questions, we need to think about it for everybody, for all of us, and how we fundamentally reorient our thinking about a lot of things in this society. Thank you, I'm really looking forward to this panel and also to the entire weekend, thank you. Thank you, Samuel, Elaine. Well, I would uh, concentrate for a moment on the nature of physical pain, because even though there are specific culprits in this, or we can at least discuss the possibility that there are culprits, drug companies, possibly physicians, possibly. Certainly one major culprit is the nature of physical pain itself. Um, physical pain is something that when you have it, you have absolute certainty that you have it. And yet if you stand outside the body of someone who's in pain, you often don't even know they're in pain. And you also have a very difficult time assessing the intensity of it. So we all know that um, from visiting physicians or being with a child who's visiting a physician that there are little series of faces that you can use to calibrate the degree of pain that you're in or that somebody you're with is in. And there, th that is both a very important invention and very helpful, and yet it shows the inadequacy of the tools we have for diagnosing and understanding other people's pain. There are other tools, there's a very brilliant tool invented by a physician, Ronald Melzack, um, who's done a lot of work on the physiology of pain, that he took the small handful of words that are used for pain and showed that, there were cert that they conformed to certain sensory dimensions. So we talk about throbbing pain or pulsing pain or flickering pain, those all express a, an interval, pulsing, throbbing, uh, fl flickering something like searing pain, burning pain, um, scalding pain, those all express a heat dimension. And out of that, he was able to better diagnose, and people all over the world were able to better diagnose pain and to better um, prescribe uh, the medicine that would work without imperiling them. Um, but the, the fact that pain is so hard to understand means that it's probably always going to be either undertreated, as it was before this epidemic began, or it's going to be way over-treated. Um, so one of the real problems here is the nature of pain, although the fact that this is an American problem and, a, and, a, 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 and happening in very specific decades means that there have to be a lot of other factors, because obviously the problem of pain in language is one that is shared across the world, and uh, the epidemic isn't uh, shared across the world. One other detail that I would mention since narrative has been brought up on several times, it's important to recognize um, the distinction that uh, was originally made by a man named Walsh McDermott in public health at Cornell Medical. Um, the distinction between narrative compassion and statistical compassion, and both of them are needed here and they involve different problems. His point was that narrative compassion is something we're not great at, but we're okay at, and we can make ourselves better at it by uh, listening to one another's stories and by uh, reading literature, for example. It's sci even scientific uh, studies have shown uh, how much you can understand about other people's minds by um, studying literature. So it's something that we're kind of good at and we can make ourselves much better at, but statistical compassion is something we're dreadful at, and we rarely get any practice in um, thinking uh, with statistical compassion. So one question.
question, I think, for us is the relation between these two. And obviously, just from the stories that have already been uh, told here, um, Martha's stories, for example, or the statistics that have already been given here, like Sandro's um, statistics, you can see the, the need for both of those avenues. Wow, this is why I love being a reporter. Do, do you feel like your heart rate's going up? There's like so much excitement in the stuff that's coming out of these brilliant minds up here. It's amazing. Okay, Nora. Yeah, no, and I'm just going, I mean, I, I cannot not comment about this, this point of Elaine because I think one of the, the aspects that made it very exciting for me, this particular meeting, is the power of the humanities to convey the emotional component of what we are living. And I, I got conveyed to me in a way, in a statistical and an emotional by someone that works at the MGH. And I was at the, at the, um, um, in a meeting organized by the Vatican and um, there was this physician that said, for the first time, we do not have problems or getting, uh, getting organ donors at uh, MGH because so many people are dying from overdoses. And to me, that was shilling. It gives you an idea of the statistics and it gives you an idea of the narrative. So, but, but I want to come back because what you're hearing from everyone here is that the different components are actually colliding into addressing the opioid crisis. And, and we need to dissect, us, dissect it if we want to actually not just control it, but preventing it from happening again. And I want to focus, and I always say it, because we have to face it up front. The opioid crisis, which is the worst we've ever seen in terms of the number of mortality in a relatively short period of time, was driven by the health system. Our healthcare system is responsible for the crisis. And if we don't see it at face value, we will not change those practices that are actually are bringing us where we are here. You can view it from different perspectives. I like to view it because I tend to believe in the goodness of humans, that it was driven by the good intentions of taking care of patients suffering from pain uh, without proper treatment, severe pain is devastating and it's associated with a very high rate of mortality secondary to suicide. So this led in 1999 for the joint accreditation to demand that if you wanted to be accredited as a hospital, you needed to um, basically screen and treat for pain. And you can look at the numbers, the prescriptions just went way, 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 way up and they hit the peak in 2011 when it was clear that we were over-prescribing 235 million prescriptions between hydrocodone and oxycodone alone for this country. 235 million prescriptions, sufficient for each one of us for one month of medications. Now, these related to the need of patients with pain, which had been ignored. Over-prescribing on opioids in no way leads to better outcomes in most cases. So that was one of the problems, a good intention. What was one of the negative ones, we became very complacent. We took the path of least resistance. Opioids are very effective when you deal with it for acute severe pain. It's much less expensive than a comprehensive management of pain. And so we very rapidly uh, accepted the propaganda from the pharmaceutical industry that if you have pain, guess what? You're not going to become addicted to your opioids. And number two, guess what? You can increase the doses and you become tolerant so you are not going to overdose and die. And that resulted clearly in a significant over, over prescription. We've been aware of it. In the healthcare system, we've been aware of it that this was going on certainly at the beginning of the 2000s. And that's why in 2011, we are starting to now see a decreases in the number of prescription of opioids. Problem, prescription opioids, were diverted, they are extremely rewarding. Opioid drugs are among the most addictive of the drugs. They can be potent analgesic, but very, very addictive. So they became, started to get diverted. So patients started to become addicted that were properly treated, and then that diverted led people to become addicted. And that, of course, as was mentioned before, created a very fertile ground to bring heroin into the country. Coming from Mexico, high purity, very low cost, and, and as people become, became addicted, they transition into heroin. And now with the synthetic opioids that for just fentanyl, for example, which is the most frequently cited one, 50 times more potent than, 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 than heroin. So if you become tolerant, then you transition into fentanyl, plus if you're a drug dealer and you lace your heroin with fentanyl, you're going to make much money. So that's where, the, the, where we are now, but it was started in the healthcare system. 
And so there was the good intentions of properly actually trying to treat patients without the knowledge and without the resources. And number two, the other big problems with the healthcare system, they have been over the ages ignoring substance use disorders. The healthcare system does not treat, consider addiction as a disease. They may say maybe it's a disease, but by the way, we don't need to treat it. And so you don't get training in most medical schools for how to even recognize it. So, so patients are coming in there, you're giving them an opioid, you don't even know who is at risk, and you don't even know how to recognize it. So that indifference for substance use disorder in the healthcare system was fundamental in this collision that we are observing. Along with the practices that we have to favor over prescriptions based on the way that we are reimbursing and how we have enabled also um, promoted advertisement from pharmaceuticals. And I think we have to state it because if we don't learn it and we don't change the system, we will have this epidemic taking different phases. I also want to make another point too. I mean, we're focusing on the opioid crisis, but if you look at the CDC numbers, we're seeing as fast as an increase in mortality from cocaine, and that's affecting predominantly African-Americans. There were 10,000 people dying of cocaine in 2016 when we were around 2,000. So it's going up, and we're also seeing significant increases in, in fatalities from methamphetamine, also going up very, very steeply. So we need to recognize that at the basis, at the comment that Sandra was saying, there is something that is making us vulnerable as a nation to addiction. And if we do not address it as a social system, we will be perhaps controlling a little bit the opioids, and then we will have other drug emerging. And at the end of the day, I, I think that what we do want to convey is that we cannot continue doing things the way that we have been doing. We've stigmatized addiction. We've stigmatized the treatment of addiction. We've stigmatized medications. We don't put the resources to actually take care of patients. Well, at the same time, and I don't want neither to underestimate, we need to focus also on the needs of patients suffering from pain. Because if we don't address them, they go to the black market and get these drugs. Okay, lots to jump in on there, but let's just start by being sure that we understand a little bit more about the basics of the face of this epidemic. So how does it break down men, women? Men, women, I can tell you that. I mean, uh, the, m in general, the total absolute numbers of people dying from overdoses is greater for males. But if you look at the different classes of drugs in prescription opioids, 45 to 54-year-old women are actually have a steeper increase in fatalities than males. And What's older? 45 to 54, and this is the age at which they are actually being prescribed, more likely to be prescribed. So if you look by drugs, in prescription opioids, women are almost equivalent as males. If you look at heroin, men are much greater. And now if you look at the synthetic opioids, curiously, um, you're starting to see men, um, uh, women go going very closely with males. Now on race, Samuel, in Massachusetts right now, the fastest growing population is African Americans of overdose deaths. It was Hispanics for a little while. Do we misunderstand this as a white epidemic? Say more about what you see and what the reality is. Yeah, I think certainly, yeah, we're misunderstanding it. I think that's part of the, I keep using the word narrative, but I might as well just keep going with it. Yeah, I mean, that is mm -hmm. part of the narrative that, ha that our, our fourth estate, our, you know, the punditry class has, has given us for a while. Like in the South Bronx, you know, in New York where I live, you know, overdose deaths there are higher than a lot of, you know, some of your highest overdose counties in the United States. So it's, it certainly has been a problem. And there's also been a way in which we've had, in, in a lot of communities, just an entrenched drug, uh, community of drug users who otherwise were surviving, but then fentanyl showed up. So a number of people like could have cocaine, been- Like cocaine, you mean? Or just long-term heroin, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, there's a lot of people who were, you know, just kind of using heroin at a low level, maintaining themselves, mm -hmm. you know, methadone mm -hmm. maybe didn't work for them. Could have been using for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, with syringe exchanges, you could do it more healthily, you can live yeah. longer. And then the supply just got tainted. So I think that hit a lot of communities as well. I think a lot of times when we talk about epidemics of drugs, we have to be careful that we're not just focusing on the drug, but also as Sandro says in his work, and as he said this evening, about the social networks in which these, these behaviors move, there are ways in which people kind of live together. So we should not just always follow the drug, but also think about the populations themselves. Mm -hmm. 
So on the population, Sandra, you, you talked about um, Appalachia and some of the socioeconomic forces that uh, may have driven, been, been the tender um, early on, but this crosses all economic classes at this point, right? Is there, is there a, a breakdown that's worth mentioning? It, it, it does, but um, the, um, th that is also fairly typical for, um, for epidemics like this, that it actually starts with uh, socioeconomically marginalized populations and then when it becomes a tidal wave, it's, uh, it crosses all classes. A couple of points, let me just build a little bit on what Samuel said. Um, we have a history in this country, the heroin epidemic in the 90s was a good example, where um, it starts in one particular racial group and then moves. So heroin epidemic was a good example. It initially was in New York in particular, it was sort of it's a white epidemic. But then we paid attention to that, then we stopped paying attention, and very quickly it became a black and Latinx epidemic. And, uh, and my read of the epidemiology is that's exactly what's happening with, the, with this opioid epidemic. That it's actually, it started off, the narrative was this is a white epidemic, and it's very quickly moving on to becoming a Min predominantly minority group epidemic. So it's, it's um, I, I worry about the public conversation focusing on one particular aspect and then stopping paying attention when it really starts ravaging particular groups. Well, why does that happen? Well, I'll tell you, I, I mean, I'm just an epidemiologist, so you, you'll have to ask oh, my colleagues who are smarter than me on this, but uh, I, um, I, I, I think there's plenty, of, uh, th there's plenty of reason to believe that um, the public conversation, which is driven by, to use Samuel's term, the fourth estate, um, um, pays attention when, uh, issues are are becoming a concern for the dominant racial group which is white racial group and we pay much less attention when it's minority groups and uh, and we lose attention when it shifts to those groups and, and we've seen it time and time again so I, I suppose I'm saying this out of an effort to make sure that as much as possible we don't do that again this time did it happen with AIDS did it happen with AIDS yeah I think so I think it does happen with AIDS I think uh, it's hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'll give I'll give another contemporary example I mean we talk there's been a lot of conversation about um, about uh, school shootings in this country. There's been hardly no conversation about the fact that school shootings affects twice as many black children as white children. Th 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 these are things we actually don't know in our, in our public discourse because we tend to focus it on a particular racialized lens. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a sticky topic. We don't like this topic, but it's actually hard to separate it um, uh, given current context. Elaine, one more piece of the, of the face that I wanna be sure we establish early on. And I apologize if this is getting complicated. It is a complicated epidemic. So we'll, we've, got, we've got two hours. We'll, we'll try to dig in on all the pieces. Chronic pain patients. So how do they figure in to this epidemic? Because in some ways we hear the heroin, people addicted to heroin and the chronic pain patients as two separate populations, right? Yeah. That's not right though, correct? Or well, tell me. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know the figures on it, but I, I do know that on the one hand, uh, there are just stories, probably many people saw the New York Times story, uh, magazine story on Sunday and that looked at Philadelphia Walmart of heroin laced with fentanyl and uh, just said that 75,000 residents in Philadelphia, Philadelphia just has a population of 1.5 million, are addicted and so forth. So on the one hand, there's this uh, sense of this you know, sea of um, spreading uh, addiction. And on the other hand, uh, the, 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 and some of that can be attributed to just profligate uh, writing of prescriptions and so forth. But on the other hand, uh, there are people who have major operations who are in steady pain who are being prescribed these things, and uh, just anecdotally, you do hear about them feeling they're undergoing personality changes from it. I don't know how much the medical community uh, is addressing that right now. Um, that it, these these drugs really can't be taken, and even when you try to use them at a reasonable level, as you were uh, suggesting, as, as a possibility, um, there's there's sometimes as reports of people feeling that their, their characters are, are changing in, in ways that are very hard to describe. I think that, I don't know, some of the things you read say that, that these drugs are not, don't, uh, don't actually, um, aren't responsible for instigating psychosis as much as other drugs. Uh, but you certainly um, hear stories of, of personalities kind of changing their contours. And this is less dire than people overdosing or people 
becoming wholly incapacitated, but it is a, a real a real problem. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, I mean, one of the issues that we haven't discussed, and we're speaking physical pain, but what we clearly see is a tremendous amount of comorbidity between physical pain, psychological pain, and addiction. And, and for example, if you look at the people that are overdosing and dying, it is estimated that perhaps between 20 and 30 percent may be suicide behavior, whether it is a full intent or whether they say, I don't want to wake up anymore. So the, the concept of the comorbidity between um, emotional suffering, uh, it makes you more vulnerable for chronic pain conditions. So mm -hmm. patients suffering from depression, for example, have higher prevalence of, of pain conditions. And patients that are addicted to drugs are highly higher prevalence of pain. And particularly in the case of uh, what happens when you get exposed chronically to opioids, whether it is for heroin or whether you are being treated for your analgesia, that can result in what we call hyperalgesia, uh, hyperalgesia which is enhanced sensitivity to pain. So that drug itself may right. be driving it. And, and it is an area that is important. And the other one is, what about this comorbidity between depression and, and opioid addiction? Is it one way? So if you are depressed and you take opioids, it can temporarily make you feel better. But the question is, if you get exposed chronically to opioids and your brain starts to develop tolerance and neuroadaptations, does that make you more vulnerable for depression? And, and there is uh, evidence to both this directionality. Just to add one thing about uh, comorbidity um, to Dr. Volkov's point. Um, um, you're talking about f physical and um, psychological um, health comorbidity. The other thing that I think is lost in the public conversation is that overdoses are seldom, really seldom, single drugs. This is, it's well established in the literature, it's been established for like 15, 20 years, that um, your chance of overdosing is much higher if you have multiple drugs. Frequently the comorbid drug is alcohol. And uh, so it's opioids plus alcohol or different kind of opioids. And we, 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 the, the conversation about opioid Overdose is like, well, it's just you're just taking one drug, and it's typically not the case. So you're dealing with um, people who are taking multiple drugs. They frequently have um, medical um, uh, comorbidities, which includes physical and psychological. So you're, you're getting this, this confluence of conditions that then result in taking of drugs, then result in the overdose. And the other thing, just to toss it out in our discussion, is we keep talking, of course, about um, overdose deaths, because those are the numbers that are easy to count. We're not talking about, about overdoses that are non-fatal. And th there is also literature, slightly less robust, about the long-term consequences of non-fatal overdoses, and that may be about twice as many people as there are who actually die. So just to toss it out in the conversation. Well, what are those long-term consequences? Well, it, it depends on the, on, the, on the extent of the non-fatal mm -hmm. overdose, but uh, people who actually have, the biggest predictor of having a subsequent overdose is having had an overdose to begin with, and uh, that's actually non-trivial, because you have an overdose death, and then you're, uh, I apologize, an overdose, then you're likely to have another overdose. You then go on to what have- is, How much does your rate go up? How much does your rate go up? Well, the conditional. If you've had one, or does that make you fifty percent more likely? The do? conditional probability of having an, another overdose is fifty percent mm -hmm. if you've had one before, um, um, and the extinguishing only happens when you sort of get later on in life. So then you have mental health consequences of the overdose. You can of course have physical health consequences that typically happen when the overdose itself happens. So these are conditions that go on and become chronic in, in a person's life, typically having co-occurring mental health, physical health issues, typically involving multiple drugs. And I'm going to comment on that because this is an area where there's very little research and I think it's one that we need to actually start to understand better because we're now... Well, well, I'm sorry, no, which, which area? Specifically the effect of multiple overdoses? Multiple overdoses, overdoses okay. because yeah. there are people now that have overdosed 20 times. We have people yeah. that overdose twice in one day. Yeah. And what, you are overdosing because the amount of oxygen to your blood drops so significantly that you lose consciousness. And the brain is extremely sensitive to what we call hypoxia, like oxygen. It actually, the neurons don't survive. So I've been wondering, I mean, I, even if you don't overdose, if you are measuring the oxygen content of someone taking heroin, which is done, for example, in some of the European countries, they treat people that don't respond at any treatment with high doses of heroin. They, they actually drop uh, their oxygen content, drop 50. To, so normally it's 90, it goes 50. If you become so hypoxemic that you lose consciousness, you are likely producing a lot of damage in your brain. And there was a paper that came out of uh, here's one of the institutions in Boston where they were actually looking at the changes in the brain of people that have multiple overdoses and reported that the hippocampus was degenerating, as a, which, which could be consistent with this hypoxemia. 
There was a paper in 2000 in the journal Brain where they were looking at people that have died from an overdose, and in them they actually show a, a higher content of tau, the protein tau, which is the one that precedes Alzheimer's. They also saw that these patients that have died also have higher content of beta amyloid. So it is likely that it is very harmful to your brain to overdose even if you don't die, and that the more you overdose, the worse it is. But, but we need to investigate it better in order to determine what is it that we can do to then help those people that are overdosing to recover so that they don't suffer from cognitive damage. What can we do? Hmm? Do we know? Well, you know, you can suffer from a stroke and they can do a rehabilitation program mm -hmm. that enables you to recover ah, function. So there's no rehab program for the eye. We gotcha. haven't done anything. I'm just putting it. This is an area that we have to start to pay attention. What are the cognitive consequences of so many people? Because the people that die is, I mean, 10 out of every person that dies on an overdose, there's at least 10 people that have overdosed. So it's one to 10. So, you are likely to have these long-lasting effects from these overdoses that we're not paying attention to and that are going to make it much harder for those individuals to recover, which is the other extremely important component in all of this. How do we help people recover? Right. So just to put some numbers on that, if there are five people dying in Massachusetts today, there are 50 people who overdosed, overdosed and probably have a problem that we need to be addressing that we aren't. <laughs> okay. Um, Samuel, on the face of the epidemic, paint the picture for us inside a common prison or jail in the U.S. right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said... What percentage, there's a fairly high percentage of people who are there because of an addiction. Right, yes. Right? True. And we are typically not treating them as patients in that setting. Correct. How is that affecting the epidemic? Okay, I'm sorry. I've, at first, I interpreted your question that you were asking me to kind of just paint a general impressionistic picture of like a day in the life. Um, yeah, we'll narrow it down a little so, bit. Uh, yeah, I <coughs> prefer not to think about that as I begin my weekend. Um, <laughs> well, some of the yeah, uh, some of the issues facing that for one is that, except for a very few places, Rikers Island actually. Um, is, is one, and then in Rhode Island, uh, Dr. Jody Rich is doing some good work there. But in most jails and prisons in the United States, addiction treatment is really paltry. It's really, it's, I mean, mental health is paltry, physical health is paltry. In 1987, there was a lawsuit, um, Estelle versus Gamble, which basically made, put the onus of all health care on corrections departments. If you, if you have somebody in custody, you, they have a human right to health care. But that's basically just a piece of paper in a lot of places. Healthcare is, is, is pretty poor. What is not understood, I think, by corrections departments, because they're corrections departments and not really, they're not healthcare systems, except in, you know, they're, they're charged with healthcare, but they don't do it very well. What's not understood is the kind of, uh, the connections between health on the inside and health on the outside. So what we have is that people who enter in really poor health, mm -hmm. and then they exit in worse health. And I mean, the, the really tragic irony in most places is that for a lot of people, I mean, the biggest predictor of going to prison is just being poor, actually. It's not really about criminality. Um, for a lot of people, their, their, their arrest in jail might be the first time they had a, a physical checkup. So we have to really, that's one of the things we have to think about with decarceration. Because, again, mass incarceration was a way to rationalize, you know, basically we had a lot of inequality. So we locked up a lot of poor people. But if you close jails and prisons, what are you going to do with them? And I'm not saying we shouldn't close jails. I absolutely believe we should. But it's the same thing with recovery. It will not do us well. It won't serve us well just to say, well, we just got to keep people off of drugs. Well, no, people are on drugs for a lot of reasons. Maybe we need to address some of those reasons as well. And so when we decarcerate, we need to think about how we treat the people that we locked up in the first place. And one of them is good mental and physical. Can I just add something to that? Just, uh, I just want to reflect on something uh, Nora said earlier. Uh, we shouldn't forget that, um, that substance use and substance dependence in particular is a brain disorder. Brain disorders, um, it, it goes by many names, but uh, mental health, mental illness, some estimates suggest that 50 to 60% of people who are in jails actually have active mental illness. Which, and, and there's a good literature on this that when we deinstitutionalized mental illness, our prisons became de facto 
places where we, we did no longer treated people with mental illness, we were locking up people with mental illness. So you have that going on, and that's been going on since sort of the late 80s and the 90s. That's been happening, more and more people with mental illness in prisons. This other brain disorder now, which is substance dependence, comes on. It's highly comorbid with uh, mental illness. So you, you can see sort of this perfect storm emerging, and then we lock people up, and they of course experience all sorts of physical traumas. We know that physical trauma is highly associated with subsequent mental illness, and then we dump them back into society, and they cycle back. So it, we, we are creating a perfect cauldron for people, and typically, the people who are get, getting caught up in this, again, the public narrative is, well, you know, the, the, the sort of the wealthy person. That, that, is, that, that story is apocryphal only by way of exception. Typically, we're dealing with people who are poor who are getting caught up in these cycles. But let me just say, on prisons, in Massachusetts, we talked about that one in five, sorry, that the five people who, on average, will die today, at least one of them, and most likely two, will be someone who was incarcerated within the last six months to a year. Because what typically happens, and Samuel, you probably know this much better than I, but that somebody who had some history of, of drug or substance use will come out and think that they can start again at the same level that they were using when they went in, and of course the body's tolerance has dropped, right? Or the supply has changed. Uh, the supply, yes, yeah. yes. The bag, the bag that you bought nine months ago might not be the same bag that you buy when yeah. you exit. Yep, and, there, and, and not only do we not have the treatment in the, in the prisons, mm -hmm. but we don't have any re-entry program. Well, the, the highest risk period after um, for overdosing on discharge is the first 24 hours. First and, 24 and, hours. And, uh, and uh, Sam will mention some of the work that Joe DeRich has been doing in uh, um, which is, the, and they've developed some now interventions to it, but the first 24 hours are the highest risk treatment, which makes total sense, right? You've been in prison, you haven't had access to the drug, so you come out, the drug has changed, you, you dose yourself wrong, and you overdose. Mm -hmm. Elaine, I know you wanted to be sure that we talk a little bit about how we got to this moment in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. And, and several of you touched on what was going on in 1999 with the Institute of Medicine report. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, how did the, how does how does the, the pill industry fit in? Okay. So the I mean, a good account I think of the pill industry at its most uh, wrongdoing can be found on the 60 Minutes website where they go into one company that uh, in one year gave uh, I think 500 million pills to people in Florida. There are only 20 million people in Florida. Um, and uh, they give a whole, a, a whole sequence of numbers like that, of, of um, one physician who gave, prescribed um, 17,000 high-dose Oxycontin in a seven-month period. But um, Nora also mentioned that, to some extent, the problem seems to have begun with a good intention to begin to address physical pain, which wasn't being addressed. And, I had the experience in the um, 1980s of noticing the incredible distance between the way in which over-the-counter um, pain remedies were advertised and the way in which the um, prescription drugs were being advertised to <coughs> physicians. And th here, here's the difference. The over-the-counter prescriptions like aspirin and Advil and, and uh, others of that, of that that, that kind of genre, were actually advertised in a way that was very understated compared to ordinary advertising of other products, such as Purdue chickens and Michelin tires and clothing and so forth, because those other products were advertised with all kind of razzle-dazzle overstatements, both about what the product could do, and it was always shown that it could transform itself into something amazing, like, uh, Frank Perdue, who sells chickens, could become a, a real hipster like Calvin Klein and, and a bottle of Tide. And, and notice that the word Tide is already a tremendous appropriation of a cultural event. Suddenly would um, spin on the television and become a map of the United States. Uh, and the aspirin commercials were doing not, none of that. They were almost pathetically boring. I mean, I, I revere what the way in which they were being advertised. but. It, you would only see uh, a head of a, of a person, if, if that. Um, often you would just see the, the aspirin itself. And they made no claim about even being able to do much. I mean, they, they would say that it could 
diminish pain somewhat. And if you could, if you had arthritis and you could only open your hand this much, now you could open it this much. Um, but it didn't tell you that you were going to become a high fashion model or that you were going to be able to, you know, write some philosophic treatise or something, um, or, or play the Goldberg variations or something on the piano. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to the kind of the way in which prescription drugs were being advertised in, um, in, in d magazines that go to physicians and surgeons. And I had the benefit of living in an apartment previously occupied by a um, physician or surgeon. And so I was getting these magazines because the person didn't bother to redirect their prescription. Oh, you have show and tell. What? Yeah, show and tell. <laughs> I, have, I have a picture here, but I'll just describe it verbally. And then I made copies of these two because you won't really be able to see them too clearly. But whereas the, the body simply wasn't present in the um, ones being advertised to the public, in the medical magazine, or, or if the body was present, it would just be the head and usually 13 layers of clothing like I'm wearing with, you know, <laughs> with bows around your neck and everything. Um, or it would just be a line drawing. Whereas in these magazines, the, the, they, they were actually brilliant accounts of the felt experience of pain. So instead of pain being some little detail, invisible detail in the person, the person would be shown as a melted body draped over big block letters of the word pain, like the kind of uh, rocks you would find on Easter Island or something. Because the felt experience of extreme pain is that you don't just have pain, pain has you. You're like a small, your personhood becomes a small attribute. Um, so this is, this is the way um, this advertisement looks. And again, I made copies so that if anyone is interested in seeing it, this is a, a drug that um, I believe has been taken off the market now. Um, Darbacid. Darbacid, yeah. because of uh, no, no, causing no, heart no problems. Yeah. But, uh, but the, the, the point is that, that it's, it's actually, uh, you know, it's, it's actually trying to, by seduction, by uh, show you the, the coerciveness of pain. The over-the-counter drugs were being advertised to people who, who didn't need to be persuaded. If you have pain uh, in, your, in your hand, you don't need an exaggeration to tell you what it would be to have that go away. But the, the advertisements in the, in the magazines to physicians are addressing people who are not in pain. And so it had to render it, and again, ingeniously render it. Um, and at the time, this is way before the uh, opiate epidemic, but writing about it, I just saw how, how can this not be uh, fatal to be doing advertisements like this. The, the other thing is that whereas the, in the over-the-counter drugs always made visible the drug itself. Now, there's nothing very interesting about what an aspirin tablet or an Advil tablet looks like, but these advertisements would have just a big depiction of the uh, tablet. Um, and so long as you have the product being included in an advertisement, it gives a locus of skepticism because it reminds you they're trying to sell you something. Um, so it, it's a very, it's a kind of, in theatrical terms, we, we would say it's a Brechtian device for making people conscious about what the ad is doing. <coughs> Where is the pill in, in these medical magazines? It's nowhere. Now, when I go online now and look up one of these pills, they do show you pictures of pills. But this is, and I only have it in black and white in this case, this is a drug called Nubane. And if this weren't in black and white, you'd see it's a huge, beautiful, luscious, seductively drawing you in red poppy. And it says, Nubane has tamed the poppy. And then it's followed by six pages. And by the way, the background here is neon lavender, like beautiful Billie Holiday type uh, you know, seductive, hypnotic um, terms. And then the next five pages are neon uh, with hypodermic needles that have moisture, condensed moisture on them. Again, hugely aesthetic. Um, and, and, and yet, by no means are they putting the, the brakes on. One other I'll just quickly mention is that the, I, managed, I said that in the over-the-counter drugs, the claim about the transformation you undergo is ex extremely modest, just that it's going to make some pains 
uh, diminished somewhat, you know. And, and, and by the way, during this time, it was shown that aspirin would, a daily aspirin might diminish the chance of heart attack, and yet that wasn't included in the advertisements. Um, since that time, there's been uh, studies done in Sweden, I don't know if subsequent studies confirm it, saying that a daily aspirin tremendously decreases the chance of colon cancer. Well, I haven't seen any over-the-counter um, advertisements of that effect. Um, but the transformation things for, for uh, pain were, were much more like this. And Visterol is something that was a, a, a calming agent, but that was advertised as in combination with the pain drug being very helpful. And I'll just describe it to you. You're looking at the, the magazine, and, and it's this beautiful, serene uh, picture of boats, and you see the masts reflected in the water, and you just kind of gaze at it, and it's happening at about a distance of half a mile. And then it's so kind of ethereal that it empties out content. So over on the other side of the page, you just see the masts and the reflection in the water. And then you suddenly realize, no, that's not mass and water, it's surgical stitches, and your eyes are a half inch away from a, a suture, a, 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 a someone who's just been sewn up. So th there again is the tremendous power of the body to, um, to require a, a, a kind of, uh, to, to almost coerce um, a, a kind of consent to it. And, and that is the nature of pain. There's something very, again, I want to say, ingenious about it because it's very hard, even in great literature, to find successful depictions of physical pain. Um, and, and yet, somehow, these, these magazine articles were able to convey its totalizing power, um, its, its subordination of personhood to physical aversiveness. Um, and uh, whether this has anything to do with the, uh, the, the outcome we're in today, I don't know, but certainly, um, as, as um, Nora and others have mentioned, the pharmaceutical companies did uh, begin to say that there could be a great diminution of pain without addiction. Yeah, no, and I want to comment on something because what you're saying is very relevant on another component that we face as our society, which is the expectations that citizens have about their ailments. So, what you are basically portraying is that the medicine should take care of the problem. And so we have the expectation that if you have pain, you will be able to get completely rid of it. And that actually facilitates, pushes towards the use of an opioid medication, as opposed to what right now the CDC guidelines are recommending, the recognition and the discussion and then the dialogue with the patient to let them know that, they, that it's okay to experience some level of pain as long as they can function properly. Because the other reality that we have to observe is that there are not many alternatives out there for the management of chronic pain, severe pain. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, can help for some patients, but not others. And the other problem with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories is they are the number one cause that uh, is requiring hemodialysis right now because they, are, they are actually have toxic effects to the kidney. We have uh, some antidepressants that work for some patients. Most do not respond. They also have side effects. We also have some of the anti-epileptics. So there's not of any, non, no one of these medications mm -hmm. is the panacea, uh, which is why the CDC guidelines is recommending for chronic pain. You need to have a comprehensive management that would include changing the expectations of the patient to teach them to deal better with their pain. One of my, the most devastating aspects of pain is the emotional reaction to it. That's what's make it harder. And thus you can, there, there are behavioral interventions for which there is evidence that it leads to much better outcomes. But it is clear that we need to put more resources to the development of alternative treatments for patients suffering from pain, as well as change the structure of reimbursement such that patients suffering from chronic pain can get the type of care that is recommended by the CDC guidelines for which most of the insurances are not going to cover. And that's why I say we cannot keep doing the, the things the way that we are doing, and that's one of We have to change the structure of how we pay. We have to change the expectations of the patients. We can no longer afford to criminalize people putting into the jail for addiction because it actually backfired to us. So there are multiple things that we need to change to address this crisis. Okay. You go ahead. No, go ahead, actually. Yeah. Rock, paper, scissors. 
give you, I'll give you your home territory. I'll give you your home advantage. You're very kind. Um, um, well, uh, and now this conversation is getting very interesting uh, because uh, what Nora is, is, is getting at, I, I, I think, is a is a larger, more fundamental problem, which I wasn't planning on talking about, but since you laid it out, I will. Um, um, because I think, I, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, you, are, you are getting at our, at how we as a society, and I'll talk about America now for a second, deals with health. And, and, and we're talking about is about the medicalization of health that we, we only think of things as disease and, and our complete underinvestment in actually living healthy and so we can die healthy and focus on really creating medicalized solutions for everything. And much of the time, those medicalized solutions are pills. Right? So it's, it's, it's our, our reflex to make everything pillable. And the reason we do that, of course, is because it's monetizable. It's easier to monetize pills. And American society is sort of OK with pills, not so much OK with shots. So when one sees this as a, as, as, as a shadow, as a reflection of this larger issue, then you can take a step back and say part of our challenge, really, is that we vastly underinvest in, in living healthy and we invest in giving ourselves pills so we can make ourselves well once we're already sick. And if you think of it that way, it, 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 ref, it would reflect a complete shift in our priority set to make health a means, not an end. To say, ultimately, we should be investing so that we can all live healthy, um, so we can go about our lives, and only take pills when we need to. So right now, what I think Nora really well started capturing is, once medicine and medicalizing everything and pills are at the front of your attention, then it's very natural to look for a pill for everything. And then it becomes very easy to take medical students in the 90s, as I was a medical student in the 90s, and to tell them, look, there's this issue, and you're under giving pills. Medical students are good and well-intentioned. They say, oh my god, I should be prescribing more. And then you start prescribing more. And, and, and hence, what we're seeing today in 2018 is a shadow of a movement that started in the mid-90s to say, we need more pills for this issue. And that, in and of itself, is a reflection of a larger societal issue that we want to find a pill for everything. Samuel. I'm glad I let you go first because actually I, <clears throat> what I wanted to say is something related to that. I just want to be careful. I think we should be careful that you know, we also keep our eye on, on the subject of discussion. The, we're here to talk about an opioid crisis, but we've noticed how we subtly made this about a pain crisis. And that kind of reinforces a narrative that we have all these people with a problematic relationship with this substance because they were you know, all in pain and then became hooked on the pills. I think some of that's overblown. A lot of it's just people who, for the same way people experiment with a wide range of psychoactive, psychoactive substances, they're fun. There's a lot of kids out there who were taking pills. Now, granted, maybe their parents were overprescribed pills, but there was a lot of kids out there who were taking pills out of the medicine cabinet or off the nightstand, and that's how it happened. And then the pills disappeared, and then they got into heroin. We have to be very careful in how we decide that certain people are worthy of our sympathy because, oh, it wasn't their fault, it was, they were in pain. And then that really implies the message that if you were doing something for pleasure, it is your fault. And I don't think, and that's, I think that's where some of the stigma lies. Everybody's innocent in this. Like every, there are no accidental it makes no sense to talk about accidental addicts the way many of us have in our common discussion. No one purposely goes out and says, you know what, I think 12 months from now, my New Year's resolution, I'm going to be just straight out, you know, <laughs> abjectly dependent upon something so that my family doesn't want to deal with me. My I want to lose all my friends. Nobody does that. Every It's accidental for everybody. So we need to be careful about how we start to make these decisions. I'm not pointing fingers at necessarily at the panel, but we should also think about some of the social, as, as Sandra was saying, some of these social dimensions here. A lot of the harms that come along with this crisis are imminently social as well, as they are with every drug crisis that we have. Like, we should really think about how we treat people once they have a problem. If you have a, a, a you know, criminal record, there's, you know, like, you're checking a box on, you know, you got, you're not eligible for most forms of higher education. You're not eligible for a lot of jobs. You know, depending on the crime you committed, you, you know, you can't get public housing or you can't even live near schools sometimes. There's not a lot of incentive there to, quote unquote, get into recovery. That's the thing that we don't talk about, that harm reduction really needs, we need to look at ourselves, we need to look at society and the harms that we put on drug users. And a lot of those harms are a lot deeper and more enduring than an overdose, than, you know, an infection from a needle 
something. We, we are doing most of that damage. I want to be very clear that we don't turn this into a pain crisis, and we really need to understand that this is a social crisis we have, and it's one that we've had for over 100-something years. Let me just add something to what uh, Samuel just said. Um, um, I, I would challenge everybody in the audience to think of uh, a, a, another, an, a, another condition that affects another organ. Let's take the heart, take the liver, take the lungs, where we know something that will make a big difference to its cost, to its um, health cost, social cost, economic cost, that doesn't actually cost us much money, but we don't do it. And it's actually very hard to think about any other disorders, but this is a brain disorder. We know many things that we can do as a society, and we don't do them. For example, safe, inje sa uh, safe injection facilities. The evidence is very clear that safe injection facilities reduce morbidity, they reduce social costs, they reduce economic costs. Could cost. you just tell people what one looks like? Does everybody know what a safe injection facility looks like? Um, um, I can summarize. I mean, briefly, yeah. safe injection facilities are facilities where, where people are, are allowed to inject uh, drugs under uh, safe conditions uh, in a way that they're supervised, make sure if they're overdosed, they're looked after, et cetera. This is a, this is a tricky, tricky issue because politically in this country, it's, it's unsustainable. I mean, we, we, from the Assistant Attorney General just a month ago, what we said, well, this is something that we do not do in this country. We know safe injection facilities work. The evidence is very good for them, but we accept that it's not okay for us to do it. And again, again I would just challenge us all. It's actually hard to think of other such things that we know work that are not too expensive. When there are things that are vastly expensive that we choose not to do about other, uh, about other organ diseases. So I come back to what Nora said. This is a brain disorder. When one thinks of it as a brain disorder, then one really has the same level of, um, one should have the same level of moral clarity about our responsibility about what we should do. And that is very far from where we're at in the public conversation. Yeah, no, and I want to comment because, of course, I resonate with Sandro and Samuel on these on these issues. I mean, everybody gets very uptight and says, "Oh, it's a brain disease," but it's a social problem. I says, "Well, look at the brain. At oh, basically, many of the medical diseases they have an extremely strong social component to it, and it, that is that social component is given by alternatives that you give to the individuals in a society." So it is not just randomness by why uh, African Americans in our country suffer much greater prevalence of metabolic syndrome and diabetes because their support, their healthcare support is much lower. So the way that I view it and I, in terms of coming, what is it that we can do is um, I, coming back to the, the, to the point that uh, Dayton, the Nobel Prize winner on economics said, these are diseases of despair that are actually driving the life expectancy down for Americans when the rest of the world is going up. And it is opioid crisis, it is uh, suicide, and it is cirrhosis from alcoholism and obesity. So here you have, so, and he goes further because it sort of says, well, how do you address diseases of despair? Because as we are having all of this dialogue, to me, the most bang for our buck comes from prevention intervention. So what is it that we as a society can do to prevent these diseases of despair? And they are, have a very strong social component that affects the way that our brain ultimately works. And, and, and Dayton had a very interesting further analysis. He says there is a factor that can lead you. So it's, it's socioeconomic, but more important than socioeconomic is education. So if we do not give education, we do not give alternatives to people. And to me, that's ultimately the most important prevention intervention that you can give to anyone. If you put them on a room when there's nothing else or alternative for them to do, they'll take drugs. On the other hand, if you build up a structure where they can excel, and particularly if you are dealing with interventions of prevention in children and adolescents, then you provide resilience. So in order for us to be able to make our country resilient um, uh, towards these drugs that are going to continue to be hitting the markets because technology is advancing on, on this synthesis, we need to give them the tools. And that requires training, education, support, social support systems as a very important responsibility that we have. So that's your main, that would be your main prevention strategy? Absolutely, give people alternatives uh, in social systems that can support them. Can I just uh, comment on prevention for a second? You know, I, I would again ask the audience to, simple question, would you, um, would you rather live in a world where there is an effective treatment for your Alzheimer's or would you rather live in a world where you don't get Alzheimer's at all? Nobody wants to live in a world where they get treated for Alzheimer's. So the question is, we, we all instinctively much prefer prevention. Now you look at our spending, our spending on our healthcare dollar, we probably spend about 3 to 5% on prevention, which is, of course, a complete mismatch between what we actually want and what we spend money on. You know, there are data 
70, about 70,000 people, almost all women, but not all, um, uh, have died from breast cancer in this country since 1990. And these deaths were preventable if we just maintain the levels of prevention that's consistent with other um, high income countries. So th we, we, we know these data. And, and you know, I go back to the, to, to, to the point that I was making earlier, that, uh, which also reflected on Nora's point, that we have a system, a, a system of medicalizing our problems and as a result focusing on on curative care, which results in us trying to do everything we can to develop pills and pillable solutions to everything, and ignoring um, efforts that are effective at prevention, for example, things like education, as Nora mentioned. In one of the primary reasons why there are so many more excess cancer cases in this country is obesity. Obesity is a, is a risk factor for, uh, for many cancers. And obesity, of course, is ultimately, is another epidemic, which we could talk about, we're talking about the opiate epidemic, we're talking about the obesity, obesity epidemic, we're talking about the gun epidemic. These are all epidemics in this country that we accept. I mean, Nora mentioned um, suicide as a, uh, one of the diseases of despair. Well, uh, suicides, the vast majority of them are actually due to guns, and guns are, are much more, have much higher fatality as uh, when somebody has suicidal ideation than other sources. So these are, we know that these are fundamental causes, and we, as a society, are accepting them, even though we actually think we deserve better. And we accept them because we spend all this money on, not on health, but on healthcare and trying to medicalize everything. So it's, it really is a very interesting turn in this conversation because it gets at a, at a much more fundamental pathology, which is how we approach our health. We're gonna to turn to you guys in just a minute. There's a mic there and one there. When I see people in front of them, I'll turn to you. Otherwise, I'll keep talking and asking questions. Thank you very much for sitting still for so long and, and staying with us, really appreciate it. Um, we're, we're not stopping. No, hold on, hold on. We're not stopping. We're not stopping. Um, I wanted to just move to treatment for a minute, and I don't, I don't, I don't mean to ignore the getting into the fundamental roots, but I want to be sure we cover right. a few more uh, areas. Okay. So I talked to you about my nephew at the beginning. Let me just tell you where he is right now. He's in a living room. It's not as big as this. It's not as grand as this. But he's probably watching um, a Friday night football game. Uh, he's out on a ranch in central Texas where the treatment is 12-step. Everybody knows what that is, AA, right? So you go through the steps, you try to process why you got addicted. There's no medical personnel on the, on the campus of this ranch. There's about 13, 14 other guys, and there's no medicine. Now, Sandor at the beginning talked about the effectiveness of a lot of treatments that are out there, but that only about 10% of people um, get them. Nora, you discussed the need to think about this as more of a disease, but also about the disconnect between healthcare and addiction treatment. Why are we there? Well, I think that um, we are there, first of all, because, again, we have, as a healthcare system, never felt that it was our responsibility either to screen or to treat individuals with substance use disorders. So we became part of the problem. And so one of the the low-hanging fruit for an intervention is to start to educate medical students or nurses or, or providers about how to distinguish and how to uh, make a diagnosis of substance use disorders and how to intervene dependent on the, the severity. I mean, one of my, my, the things that keeps me, there are many things that are keeping me awake at night because we are, it's a tragedy what's going on right now in our country with the opioid crisis, but it's also the opportunity of changing the way that we've addressed substance use disorders and to bring treatment into ways that are going to be more effective. But there is another component that is making me also very nervous that it is we don't not, neither want to over prescribe. So, so we know that medications for opioid use disorder for those suffering from a moderate to severe can save your life. I mean, your likelihood of dying from an overdose is three to four times higher if you are not on medication than if you are. Yet at the same time, what you don't want to be doing is to prescribing these medications to someone that doesn't have an appropriate diagnosis. And so because we are in a desperate situation, sometimes we do desperate actions and we tend to simplify everything in black and white. Clearly, we need to, one of the most important tools that we currently have to address the crisis is to provide for treatment, treatments for those that need, that have an opioid addiction and medications can be incredibly helpful. At the same time, I completely agree, there are other interventions that are harm reduction interventions to, to, to protect the people. So if you give them naloxone, you give them time because you prevent them from dying. 
to make those expanded, to give them access to syringes so that they don't get infected with hepatitis C. Nobody's speaking about it. hepatitis C is going way, way up, or HIV, or other um, the infections that are transmitted by the injection of these drugs. We need to pr also provide that comprehensive intervention uh, that will provide prevention to, uh, to, to the nation because we cannot just be addressing this and then these other drugs. I, I mentioned cocaine and methamphetamine are going up. So we cannot just say, okay, we're going to fund, fund this and let's forget about the other. We have to have a plan for addressing the whole concept of prevention and expand treatment. And cover for treatment and get rid of all of the obstacles that many of the Medicaid uh, are given for a physician in order to prescribe the proper treatment. They have to document that they have hit bottom, that they have failed for something else, and they are not covering for all of the medications. So we have an enormous amount of stigma with, with respect to the way that we are providing these treatments, and we need to change it. I, I want to, just, just to add to that, I just also we, I, we should be clear that harm reduction isn't just about needles, naloxone, or handing out condoms, <clears throat> or it's 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 quite a bit more than that. And for many many people in this country in this world, it is actually the beginning of recovery. We tend often, as Sandra was saying, uh, uh, the way we medicalize recovery and medicalize this thing that we call addiction, we sometimes fetishize medical, what we call treatment. And we don't understand that recovery is a life course. It's a cognitive, it's a psychological development that can go on for years. Like recovery for a lot of people begins the first time they said, you know, I should probably stop doing this. And they might not actually get to where they want to be for another five years. But we have to understand that that process begins at that gestational moment. And so harm reduction, where we have the safe injection safe consumption sites, where we have needle exchanges, anywhere where we have people doing that type of work, where they may not be part of this treatment industrial complex. They, they will give you information about how you can find treatment. They won't all be 12 step. I also want to be very clear that we fetishize abstinence in ways that are very, very dangerous. We get a lot of overdoses from people. It's something else we don't talk about. People who go to these, go to programs, and they'll be doing great for 30 days, 28 days, even six months. And because they haven't prepared themselves for that inevitable stumble, I don't call it a relapse, I call it a stumble. Because usually every time someone stumbles, they learn something that they didn't know about themselves before. But if they're not, if they're in an abstinence only mindset, that stumble happens really hard. And they haven't planned for it safely. And they'll go out and get the first bag they can get because they just white knuckle through the whole thing. And that's so we get a lot of overdoses that way. We have to be really creative in how we think about recovery. And sometimes it's not just these treatment programs, which are not, you know, they're not standardized, they're not, they're not all that good. And even the good ones don't always work for everybody. I mean, who? I mean, you don't have to show your hands, but you know, if you're over a certain age or maybe not, like you might have dabbled with, with tobacco, and if you had it for a while, you quit a lot of times, right? I mean, raise your hand if you did a lot of tobacco and then you quit once and that was it. And so, <laughs> God bless you. You might be a liar, but God bless you anyway. Um, like even the best treatment programs, like 10% success rate is good. We don't like that in America. Like, if you can't give me, you know, return on my dollar, you know, I want 95% return, then this clearly doesn't work. That, no, that's not how it works. Like, it's patience. It's cognitive work. We, it is, like, we do talk about the brain disease part, but I think we don't understand the processual part of it, that people are working on their own stuff, and we have to be patient with that. And when we start embracing abstinence only, we start thinking, oh, we just got to get them into treatment. A lot of people just aren't ready for treatment yet. And until they are, we got to keep them safe and do what we can for them. But we get, this is how we got the drug laws in the 1970s and 1980s. We threw out a lot of treatment programs out there. That's how we got the Rockefeller drug laws in New York. We were actually locking people, forcing people into treatment. It doesn't work. Drug courts, a 
lot of those are just forcing people into treatment. It will not work. We have to be a lot more patient about it. It's just but you know, you uh, sorry, Samuel, the only issue that I would like to say, and I completely, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the body has also a way of healing itself. I mean, my only concern with the opioid crisis is that some of these drugs are so, so little that it's extraordinary. Your risk of dying is so high when you are addicted these days to opioids, extremely high. So that's where you say it's like, um, I mean, we speak about these cancers that kill you. Uh, if you are addicted to opioids, um, your likelihood of dying is very high if you don't get treatment. Safe, safe consumption sites, tip, at least the ones of which I'm aware, I'm not going to say that, there's about 100 SCSs throughout the, throughout the world in about 10 countries, only one in North America as of yet, hopefully Philadelphia and, and Seattle, um, and hopefully New York City as well. Um, there's about 100 SCSs in about 66 cities in 10 countries. A lot of those have fentanyl testing strips as part of the deal. So that not only you're giving a clean needle, but you're also giving a way to say, hey, you should be, like, do you know what you're about to put in your arm? Um, and there's ways that you could do that. We also see these at raves, for example. There's testing kits to see, you know, you think you, think you bought some MDMA. Like, I'm about to see some really nice colors and feel really good about this DJ that I've been wanting to see. And then it turns out I got something that's really bad. Mm -hmm. Or you might just got ripped off. You might just got a bunch of baking powder. But either way, you want to know. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is part of the deal. Harm reduction is a lot more than just helping people use drugs. I want to be clear because a lot of us think that, and it is a, it, the research has also in on this, and not just, not just do they prevent overdoses and prevent HIV and HCV, hepatitis, but they also have proven time and again needle exchanges and SCSs as really reliable ways of getting people in recovery. So hold on, guys, you're on a roll, I know, but I gotta call a timeout because we've got eight people standing in line. Don't, don't, uh, okay. Can I ask you to start? And would you mind saying your name and maybe where you're from? Okay, uh, my name is Elsa Vivant. Uh, actually, I come from France. I'm a social scientist, uh, a visiting scholar in Harvard, and I'm uh, studying the response to address the uh, uh, opioid crisis. And I have two questions. The first is for uh, Professor Galea. Can you Just one, I'm sorry, we gotta, do, we gotta keep it, thanks. Pick one. What is an epidemic? And are there any survey about drug use, not offenses in the criminal system, not the, the fatality of those, but who are the drug users for a long period of time to be able to discuss the narrative of the new face of the heroin based on the data on use? Um, very quickly, in, in epidemic, there's no uniform definition for epidemic. An epidemic means something that's occurring at a, at a rate that's above normal baseline. So uh, the uh, it's, it depends, of course, what normal baseline is, but anything that's increasing at the pace at which the opioid epidemic has been is by definition epidemic. On the second answer, absolutely, there are many surveys about, uh, about uh, drug use. You can, there are many population-based surveys um, about, uh, that look at the use of commonly used drugs, which show prevalence, et cetera. Um, and, and I'll use that as a way of saying what I was gonna say before, which is um, that these surveys, tell us, these surveys tell us something which I think emerged from what Sam was saying, um, substance use disorders are chronic disorders that last over a lifetime. It's poorly understood in this country that the most expensive disorders for the medical system are actually brain disorders. Brain disorders cost us more money than anything else. And the reason is because they're prevalent and they're lifelong. They go across life. And we know that from surveys. Hi. What's your name? Hi. My name is Pam Littlefield. I'm from New Hampshire. And I just have a question. I, in New Hampshire, I'm very involved with the inter integrated delivery network you may be familiar with. Um, it, we are doing an incarceration, what we call an um, enhanced care coordination is one of the projects. And we do work with drug, drug courts um, in New Hampshire. Um, they are actually very successful or, or more positive um, at the moment. Um, my question is, I work, first of all, I just lost a nephew three weeks ago to this that was oh, just so sorry, Pam. I'm sorry. dabbling in this. I work in this, and um, my question is, where is the medical community in coming together with a narrative that's evidence-based that the public could better understand because of the stigma of substance use in our country? So many people are, you know, are, we have a lost generation, if you will. I think my nephew was one of those people that just was lost, you know, at 20 years old, not trying to figure out where they were going, what he was doing, and, you know, where is the medical community in, in devising and in coming together with a narrative that is 
evidence-based that the government could understand, because really this is based on money. This is based on support and understanding from the public and legislators what this is really about. And I've testified for certain things in New Hampshire even, and you know, some of these legislators are, are so out of the realm with regard, they think it's natural selection. I mean, <laughs> you have people okay. that just do not understand. Mm -hmm. So where is the medical community? Well, what, what I'm going to say is this, this is one of our main priorities, though. So that Congress has allocated $500 million to NIH on a yearly basis to develop research that can help us address. So one of the main one is how do you actually create models that can use the healthcare system in order to address substance use disorders in general, and in particular, opioid use disorder, that's one. Second, to generate a network in the justice setting that can develop models uh, in order to properly treat individuals so that they, when they get released from jail or prison, they are basically followed up in treatment and recovery. So these are the two main structures where we are putting resources. And I do want to make a point that is important because for many years, actually until very, very recently, I was taking the data that comes from the survey by SAMHSA that says that out of people that require addict addiction, only 10%, and that's what Sandra was commenting on, are aware and claim that they need treatment. And I believe, well, one of the big challenges that we have is how do we make people aware that treatment can help them? And then one day, someone presented me data from France, and they showed, you know, in France, they had a severe problem of overdose. So the healthcare system, without any stigma, very specifically uh, provided with access to buprenorphine treatment for any patient that had an opioid use disorder, it would cost them nothing, no obstacles. 70% of the population went into treatment, and that significantly reduced the overdose fatalities. So it made me aware that the way that we co communicate basically whether we are openly stigmatizing the person that's addicted by or the way that the healthcare system interacts with them is maybe leading individuals to not recognize that what they have could be improved by an intervention. So, I mean, this is, so I've started to, to, to question myself to what extent the way that we are actually presenting treatment to people are making them afraid to seek them out. And, and I think that it is very much uh, addressing the importance that the healthcare system has into changing that narrative. I just, just add one quick thing, which actually this is a thing Samuel said, but I feel it's important to underscore here. Nobody, nobody sets out to become uh, substance dependent, period. It's just nobody wants, nobody wants that. Nobody chooses that for themselves. And, uh, and, and number one, number two is there is, there's nothing worse than blame on this. And, and this is such a powerful societal narrative that, uh, that somehow, in your mind, you think, well, if you're using drugs, you brought it on yourself, and and, and that distorts our entire our entire conversation on this. Hi, I am Luz Lopez, and I'm a faculty member in the School of Social Work, and um, I'm from Puerto Rico originally, and in both in Puerto Rico and here, it's a huge problem, the opioid crisis, and one of the concerns I have is that we talked about mental health, the com the comorbidity of mental health and addiction but the treatment of integrated care for both at the same time continues to be very, <laughs> very limited. Um, that's one problem. And the other one is that it's a social problem, a problem of the community and a problem of the family. And when the person leaves treatment, the follow-up doesn't include, um, the, there is no very limited services for family support and community support. Any particular question? Uh, just responding to that, how uh, can we increase the, the, the integrated treatment, mental health uh, and uh, addiction, well, the and the follow-up? Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, and I, and I very much also, that's something I resonated even as a resident in psychiatry. I couldn't believe that they were not uh, actually training us to address problem of addiction. And so in working with the American Psychiatric Association, one of the things that we're basically trying to build, that all of the residency programs for psychiatry should be able to train to train them on how to manage substance use disorders. And now with the crisis, we want to be certain that they are able to properly prescribe the medications to treat patients. So the, uh, I think that this is starting to happen in many uh, residency programs across the country. 
so that we don't have those clear cut separation or either it's a mental illness or it's an addiction. I mean, they are so comorbid that it's rare to have uh, them to totally separated. Can I also say that I think it's, this is also echoing something that was said earlier on. It's also important that we think as well about treatment as being broader than just, I think, what we typically think of with the 28-day programs or the support groups or, or 12-step. And also think that for a lot of people who have hit what Nora called rock bottom, that means you've lost a lot in your life. And what's most effect, the most effective interventions for those people is not just let's find out how we can get you off of drugs, but also how do we get you some housing? How do we, you dropped out of school in your sophomore year of high school. Maybe we can start thinking about it as, as a goal. So I wasn't, my earlier comments, I'm not against treatment. I just wanna say that we should all be realistic that A, a lot of people need more than just what is being offered. And as, as was alluded earlier, treatment is, is not always good. I think we all know that at this point, right? There's a lot of bad programs out there. And people need more than what's available. So it's, as Sandra was saying, only 10% of people actually have access to it. And then we also have to think about what's the quality of that, that of what they, to which they have access as well. So I'd, I'd like us to think more about that prevention and that larger picture, and as well as the treatment. Lastly, I'm a current sophomore in Sargent College, and my question to speak to your point, Dr. Roberts, is what methods and ideas exist to change current healthcare education and funding to focus on prevention instead of treatment? You said, I'm sorry, the first part, you said training? Training in both healthcare education for doctors, psychiatrists, those providers, and where does the funding come from to focus more on prevention? In terms of medical school training, I, I would probably uh, leave that to Dr. Volkoff and, and Galea here who are both work in those fields. I, I don't know how doctors are being trained right now per se. And it, I, what I do know is that from a public health point of view, where it is, you know, where in, in a pub, from a public health perspective, we think about what the population is doing. We tend to think about the, epidem the epidemic and social context. We are very much, we are probably more concerned with what, I'm trying to think of the epidemi, uh, Tim Rhodes, uh, Tim Rhodes, the uh, ethnographer and epidemiologist, called structural vulnerability, for example, mm -hmm. and how, you know, how it's not coincidental that we kind of, that we see some of the worst epidemics in areas that were already vulnerable, made vulnerable economically or, or socially for other reasons that seem to have nothing to do with the drug. I don't know if that answered the question, I'm, but I cannot, I'll leave the, the yeah, answer. I'll just make one, one very quick com comment. It's, uh, it is not a contradiction to say that uh, substance dependence is a brain disorder, but also it's highly susceptible to social context. These two are both truths, and uh, uh, as a result, a, a broader population health perspective that understands the social context is congruent with and can have synergies with a medical curative perspective. The challenge has been that uh, the two have been balkanized for many, many decades, and there's many reasons for that, which we can get into. Is medical education getting better? Well, I'll give you, I, I, I think it's maybe getting a little bit better. I think it's better than when I was in medical school, but uh, I think we've got a long way to go. I don't know, Nora, if you feel otherwise. Well, you know, I mean, I, and I'm going to say this because I think that, again, I started by saying we have to change perspective. I think that we've turned uh, medical uh, treatments into a business, and because it is a business, uh, prevention is not a good return. I mean, and I think that what I've also learned in this position that I have is that a, a policy can have, a good policy can have a much greater impact than anything else. And it is going to require some policies to try to address the importance of prevention interventions. And because many of the, the ch big challenges that we have are driven by diseases that in principle could be preventable. So unless we change this model of trying to make as much money as we can for every single patient, uh, prevention is not going to be a priority in the health, uh, in, in the educational system. And I, I mean, uh, certainly I think that the training now is improved because you have access to a massive amount of information. But on the other hand, your training may be curtailed by this model that is becoming increasingly more driven by profits as opposed to the best outcomes. And 
I leave it at there. You know, if you think about it, we um, we accept as a society that um, in this country there are millions of preventable deaths every year, and we, we just know that. And I would ask you to just wonder why is that acceptable? Why is it acceptable that there are preventable deaths? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kimber, and I'm a PhD student here in art history. Um, I'm I want to bring up a term that I feel like has been kind of circled around but not directly addressed, which is shame. Um, I feel like shame kind of fits into both like the poverty side and the pain side. And I think the other side of shame is um, what we mean by saying healthy bodies. So I think we actually, I would say, as a society fetishize healthy bodies, um, assume everyone is al always healthy by looking at people. Um, and so I think that kind of maybe addressing health as a, as a characteristic that we attribute to people a little bit further would be useful. Um, and like maybe changing realistic claims about what kind that there can be maybe different levels of healthy bodies or kinds of healthy bodies um, would be a part of that. So I guess shame and health are two words that I feel like um, I would like to hear a little bit more about in relationship to. Just say one thing about health. Sorry, I'll leave, I'll leave shame to somebody else. But uh, um, uh, as I, we always should. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just not. I'm not qualified to talk about that one. But on health, maybe I am. Um, um, I, 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 this goes back a little bit to something I said earlier, which uh, I think health is. Um, health should be a means, not an end. And uh, health should be. Um, uh, health should should be the, your capacity to do whatever you want to do in your life. So. Uh, so health should be the absence of something else about your body that gets in the way of you trying to do things, as simple as that. And that is a very different approach to health than our typical approach to health in this country, which is an approach which says we are trying to maximize health and maximize longevity, for example, um, so we can live forever. Health really should be, it's, it's like your car. Do you really want to be worried about put, taking your car into the shop? No, you just want your car to work. And uh, that should be the same for health and for our bodies. Shame, I'll let somebody else talk. But I, I think the issue of shame to me is very much interlinked with the whole concept of stigmatization and the way that we look at uh, someone and what the ideal should be. And uh, there are some diseases that are more stigmatized than others, but having certainly had a history, a family history of addiction, I do know that there was a lot of shame in my family to speak ab about it. And actually, the members of my family that have been addicted themselves were very ashamed of it. And I get letters from people writing to me, thanking me for actually putting forward information that lets them be aware that it's not just their fault because they've always felt very guilty that they didn't have the power, the willpower to overcome those very strong desires. So shame is at the essence of part of the terrible problem that people suffering from addiction as well as other mental illnesses have to face on a daily basis. And I do agree, shame also may permeate other diseases, but it's most prevalent in mental illnesses and addictions, and we need to remove it because it actually creates distress in the person, and uh, it leads them to be afraid to seek for help, seek, seek treatment. So I think that uh, we need to actually destigmatize the disease and uh, embrace, and, I, and to me, one of the things that was so attractive about this meeting here is that it is the humanities. The humanities has a, a voice that actually can resonate and have an impact on changing that type of, of attitude towards uh, shame and stigma to try to, to destroy it. Folks, I'm so sorry, but we're only going to have time for two more questions. Can the other four of you who are standing up come up afterwards, do you mind? I, I'm, I really apologize for making you stand there, but can you go ahead? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Megan Kelly. Um, I am an administrator here at BU in the Classical Studies Department. Um, but my husband is a paramedic in Massachusetts. Um, and one of the things that he struggles with is there's a lot of stigma against drug users in the first responder community. Um, how would you encourage a culture change and the development of empathy for overdose patients, for first responders who are seeing a lot of the like worst moments? Well, you know, the, that's a, a wonderful question, and I can just think of an analogy for uh, a, a, a kind of problem for first responders in the case of burns. Um, first responders in the case of burns can be overwhelmed by the um, visage of somebody whose body and face have just been eclipsed under a mass of terrible damage, 
And so uh, a, a procedure has been developed called the rule of nines, which lets the first responder um, quickly assess, each body part is a multiple of the number nine, and it lets the person be able to look at the body and assess the problem and, uh, and therefore begin to both administer the correct uh, procedure and also to let the hospital that's waiting for the patient to know what, what is coming. But uh, obviously the case of, of uh, the drug overdose is very different. But you know, your idea that there could be some kind of exercise or some kind of chart or some kind of uh, you know, mental practice that uh, would make that much easier is, is I certain, certainly think on the right path. I would just, I would add to that is it might be also a thing of perspective as it is with all of us, you know, we, we have a professional path and we see the world through that lens. Unfortunately, your husband sees people at their worst moment. And sometimes I would imagine the same person even twice or three times in a day. And at a certain point, if not through his mind, through his colleagues, like, why are you doing this? Like, I'm, this is my third time coming to your house this month. Like, you're just an idiot for doing this. And that's not a sympathetic way to, to view, but I think that's where they are in terms of how they see the world. A counter, a, a, an antidote to that is also just knowing, uh, knowing people who are in recovery, people who have used drugs or do use drugs. And we talk about you know, drug users, we talk about addicts or people who use drugs as though that's all they do all day long. You know, it's like that's on there, everything they sign, you know, the <laughs> birthday cards they write, the W-2 forms and all that, I'm a drug user. And you know their mothers, their fathers, their they, their you know their employees. They do a lot of things, and I think we, unfortunately, the, because of our professional silos, we dehumanize a lot of people. And and I don't even mean dehumanize like in the most ugly of ways. We just see, we see one dimension of everybody around us. I, I work at a at a school. I tend to see a lot of people as students. You know that's just how it is. Um, and I just always have to remind myself they're more than that. Just because I only see them for two hours a week. In classroom doesn't mean that when they're not there, they just sit on a shelf someplace and wait for me to come back. <laughs> Maybe they do. <laughs> I, I would suffer from the most severe form of narcissism if I thought that were true. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, What's your you. question, sir? I guess I have the last, uh, is this, yeah, I guess I have the last question, so I'll try to make it quick um, and make it a good question. Um, so my name is Chris Cobb. I actually, uh, I work as a manager of an overdose prevention coalition here in the Boston area. So this is what I do all day long. Um, and, oh, well, thank you for clapping. That's really nice of you, but that's not why I mention it. Um, so this question is to kind of take us back to the humanities piece. Um, so what I see from my perspective is, um, I'll just make this quick and say um, that people, first of all, I don't see people as victims, I see them as survivors and as resilient, and I think um, it's really important to change the narrative on that, so that's just a little, um, that's a little diatribe, but that just comes from the work that I do. Um, so thinking about that, um, I, I'm really interested to hear your perspective, if you have it, on examples from other, I would say, collective traumas. I see, I see the overdose epidemic as a collective trauma. That's the way that I look at it, um, and this idea of community disintegration. So when you think about places like South Africa, they've had reconciliation, right? In places like Rwanda for genocide, they've had, you know, they've had that type of thing as well, where the community reintegrates. Now those are extreme examples, but I don't think that it's it's unreasonable to think of the overdose epidemic in that way. So um, how can we um, frame this in terms of collective trauma? Uh, what is the value in that, and um, how can we sort of think about this idea of community reintegration because it is sort of a disintegration of a community, um, and it's a failure on all parts. Um, so that's that's what my question is. Thank you. I, if we're going to start doing truth and reconciliation, we should start with the war on drugs, though, not the, well, yeah. not the opioid <laughs> crisis. I mean, that's. I mean, there are literally millions of people who. I mean, we're about to decriminalize. We have decriminalized. We're about to turn marijuana into a multi-billion-dollar industry. And there are people still in prison serving time for selling marijuana, or people who cannot get, you know, whose economic mobility is truncated because they have a marijuana sales or another drug sales. I mean, it's, it's a lot of capital has been taken out of certain communities behind the war on drugs, and it, it, it didn't work. If the, if, the, if the object was to stop drug use, it 
clearly did not work. If the object was to demobilize a lot of people and, you know, shorten their life chances and the things that they could expect in life, then it was an absolute success. So I agree with you. There needs to be truth in reconciliation. I've actually spent some time thinking about, like, just doing a fully loaded cost accounting of the war on drugs. I don't even know how to do it. Like, all the things you, years of life lost, years of income lost, destruction of communities, I don't know how you do it, but. Maybe somebody here can help you. Let me just, uh, let me add, uh, this this, this, this gets political very quickly, but uh, the, um, and I alluded to this earlier, but I I, I think the opioid epidemic is uh, one of several epidemics in this country, including I mentioned firearms epidemic of obesity, which is ultimately directly linked to the widespread availability of uh, calorie-dense, nutrient-poor food. And we've talked uh, quite a bit uh, um, on this uh, panel about the fact that um, there are, there's no one to blame, and by no one to blame, I want to be very clear that we were referring to the people who are actually substance dependent themselves. But there actually is quite a bit of blame. I mean, there, there, there is very, very clear um, uh, action driven by, by commercial interest that has driven a lot of these epidemics. And, 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 and there's plenty of blame to go around on that. So if one is to, to go down the, if one is to open the Pandora's box you're, you're advocating for, and I'm actually not against opening the Pandora's box, I just want to label it. Um, we would then peel back layers and layers of, uh, of political, industrial um, action with a lot of social sanction, I just want to be very clear about that, that, uh, has, that you can trace back, that has triggered the steps that resulted in these epidemics. So if we, if we were to get into truth and reconciliation on that, we're going to need to deal with that. And I, I don't think we're anywhere near ready to deal with that. Okay, we're going to wrap. I'm going to ask each of the panelists, and they only have 30 seconds, to give you as an audience some marching orders. What's one thing that they would suggest you can do leaving this event to make a difference in regards to the opioid impact? And Susan will be closing after that. Anybody ready to go? You got 30 seconds. We can start over there with the male creatures <laughs> of the species. I think it's only fair you start, Dr. Volkov. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I mean, whichever way, no, no, no. I, I think if anyone's given marching orders, I think it's you. I think <laughs> yeah, you want to know? I, I basically, what I'd like us to, to realize, I mean, you've discussed how complex this issue is, and, and to me, one of the big, uh, one of the reasons why we became so successful on addressing the HIV crisis is we were able to bring citizens together to take responsibility and do something about it. And as we are sitting here, each one of you has a different perspective, and, but each one of you can help address the opioid crisis in a unique way. So that would be my message to you. I mean, it's actually like many times we just see things at a distance. I think we cannot afford to see things at a distance, and so I would say get, get engaged. Um, and you can do it through art, or you can do it through medicine, or you can do it through um, basically creating groups. But but make people aware of this, that we can no longer ignore addiction. We need to address it. Well, I guess that, you know, if you're like me, you know many people in your family and neighbors and friends who have had some operation in the last couple of years for which they were prescribed Oxycontin. I don't have know anyone who had an operation who wasn't prescribed Oxycontin. And in many cases, they uh, felt that it could be solved with um, Advil. They, on their own, felt they didn't want to take the drug. They took Advil. And in other cases, they didn't, and they are having some problems as a result. But if my experience is duplicated by any of your experience, it means that right in your environment, you have people, or you yourself, will sometime be uh, offered this drug. And I think that. It's at that moment that you really have to stop and, and think about whether it, it is something that should be um, started. The other thing is that I guess um, you know, I was trying to look for uh, places in addition to the medical community that, that could help, since we know in the case of alcohol that, it's, that something like AAA has helped a lot of people. Um, and so I looked a little bit on churches, and there are various churches that have started to create support groups. And um, if, you're, if, if, if one is, I'm actually not a member of a church, but um, I have family members who are members of churches. And, uh, but if you're not a member of a church, it might be that you're a member of some other thing that has an assembly structure 
that um, that could offer support to people in uh, in whatever neighborhood you live in where there, there may be problems. Brilliant, Elaine Samuel. You really have to stick to 30 seconds. Oh, sorry. That's okay. You get 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, I would uh, simply say remain calm and be level-headed about it. There's recent data that it's shows that in certain localities we're about to peak with the overdoses. We can expect to decline. These are classically how every drug epidemic since we've been keeping data has happened. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I can tell you as a historian, this is usually the moment where we pass the most draconian drug laws. 1986, crack cocaine was in decline. Rockefeller drug laws in 73, heroin was, was already well in decline by then. So now the moment is to just be calm, we do what we can, we do the prevention work, we get tr people into treatment where they want treatment, where the treatment works. But we don't do anything rash when those measures don't work immediately the way we like them to. How was that? That's perfect. Thank you, <laughs> Sandra. You know, in a in a divided time, in a divided country, health is probably one of the only universal values. It's not a red state value. It's not a blue state value. Everybody wants to be healthy, so we should act accordingly. We should demand health. We should demand governance for health. That that government action ultimately is going to promote health on all its axes. That uh, cross sectoral corporate action, private sector, public sector action, all promotes health. Ultimately, unless we demand health and we understand what it is that causes health, and we had a lot of conversation about that today, we will not get it. And this, and this is something that is, that is sorely lacking in the American conversation. I'm Susan Mizraki, Director of BU's Center for the Humanities. I promise to make this quick. Um, let me just say, first of all, that this was a wonderful, illuminating panel, and, and thank all the panelists for their contributions. Uh, I also uh, am... Yeah. I also want to say that I'm delighted to see you all here for this first panel of our forum, Humanities Approaches to the Opioid Crisis. Uh, I want you to know that our forum continues tomorrow at BU's Law School Auditorium with a morning panel starting at 9 and an afternoon panel starting at 1.30. I'd like to thank President Brown for finding time in his busy schedule for our event. I'd also like to thank the Provost's Office and the CAS Dean's Office for funding support and Tamsin Flanders for her expert handling of this forum and of everything that we do at the Humanities Center. And finally, many thanks to Sandra Galea and the School of Public Health for co-hosting this forum and for sponsoring the reception that I hope you will all join me at now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>